After a person is infected with something for the first time, it takes about a week in order for antibodies to really be ramped up in production and to be present in the blood. So it takes about a week to get to that point. Um, in this case, the person will get sick. Once those antibodies are really in production, then they will start to hopefully get over uh, their sickness. But an interesting thing happens um, so this is a, a graph showing plasma antibody concentrations. So again, about a week and then production starts to ramp up. An interesting thing happens if that same person is later exposed to the same pathogen, um, they don't have to go through this whole process the second time around. The second time around, antibody production, look at this, it spikes extremely fast within a couple of hours. And look at the levels. The levels are just way higher than anything we saw in the primary response. Um, so the second time around, probably this person is never even going to feel sick. They probably won't even know that they were exposed to anything. Um, so this is due to the immunological memory that we have. This is why it's so key to have memory B cells. They stick around and they remember infections um, so that the response can be much more efficient the next time. So this is called active immunity. Active immunity can be induced by a primary infection, um, but it can also be induced by other means. We can use vaccines in order to have the body go through this first production process. Um, the vaccine triggers the body to start producing antibodies, and then the next time, if there is a next time, if we're exposed to that same pathogen, the thing that we were vaccinated for, um, then the body is ready to go. It's ready to just jump into that secondary response, which is much quicker. So in that case, the person wouldn't get sick or their sickness would be much less severe than what they would have had to go through had they not been vaccinated. So vaccines, how do we make vaccines? Vaccines um, can be made a few different ways. So vaccines for, um, for viruses, we've got a few different options. Okay, so um, I don't know how much you know about viruses going into this, but viruses, in most cases, they have kind of a shell around them. It's called a, a capsid, and it's a protein shell. And then inside of that, they have a genome, either DNA or RNA. So if you think about what is it that, the, that our immune systems are going to see if we experience a viral infection, the first thing that our cells are going to see is that outer shell of the virus. So it actually works quite well to just take that outer shell of a virus, maybe even just take a fragment of the shell um, and use that as, as a, a substance that you inject into the person and that will trigger an immune response to ramp up. There's no infectious virus present, right? Because we didn't insert the genome into the person. We just put a little piece of the shell. So that's one possible way to make a vaccine. There are a few other possibilities. We won't go through all of them in a lot of detail, but it's possible to just use actual virus that has been deactivated in some way, a killed virus vaccine. That's an example, um, the, the salt polio vaccine was an example of doing just that. We could also use a virus that is alive, a virus that has its replication abilities, but um, use a strain that's been attenuated. So in other words, take the viral strain, the thing that you wanna develop a vaccine against, take it, um, you have it in either an animal host or in cell culture, and um, replicate it until you end up with a strain that has become not virulent, so not disease causing. Um, so it's still a, a replicatable virus, but it's not gonna cause the problem that the virus, original virus would have. Um, that's pretty much the MMR vaccine. That's what the MMR vaccine is. It's a live virus, but it is really attenuated, so it doesn't cause disease anymore. We can also nowadays use recombinant um, genetic engineering in order to produce vaccines of our choosing. Sometimes depending on, uh, depending on the vaccine and depending on the age of the patient, sometimes other additives are given as well with the vaccine. Adjuvants, adjuvants are molecules that tend to boost the immune response. They tend to cause more inflammation. And sometimes these are added, um, for example, with the flu vaccine, the flu vaccine for older adults over age 65, a lot of times it has 
um, either a higher level of antigen or it might have some adjuvants added in just to stimulate the immune system a little bit more. Because again, as we age, our immune systems start to decline. So sometimes the vaccines need to be tailored to the age group that we're dealing with. There's also something called passive immunity. Whereas active immunity involves our own bodies producing antibodies, passive immunity is something different. Passive immunity involves sort of handing off antibodies from one individual to another. And there are a few natural examples of this and there are some unnatural examples of this. Um, this is what happens with mothers. So uh, how, how the mother's immune system protects the fetus is through passive immunity, the fact that her antibodies can be transmitted into the fetus. After childbirth, same thing, but through breast milk. And then we've also got um, one example down here for artificial passive immunity. A good example of this is antivenom for snake bites. So this is something where, um, I think this is usually developed in animal subjects, like I'm not sure if it's sheep, I, uh, sheep pigs or cows. Anyway, um, what happens is a small amount of the venom is given to the animal, not a lethal dose, but just a little bit, enough to trigger the animal to start producing antibodies. And then we collect the antibodies from the animal and use that um, to, for, to treat people who have been snake bit. So that's another example of passive immunity.